Hello, hello. Are we live? Looks like I'm live and audio is working. All right, welcome back to my font parsing and rendering project. Uh, so far, we have been exporting the data that we want to visualize to Scilab and using Scilab for visualization. Today, I would like to start using Fortran for visualization without shelling out to some other program. Uh, not sure if I'll be able to finish that today, uh, but I, th I hope I can at least get a start and maybe like draw a pixel or a rectangle uh, or best case scenario, a line and even a spline. Uh, we're still working with the outlines of fonts. We're not going to fill them in yet. Uh, so whatever we have in Scilab, that's what we're going to try to translate into Fortran. So if we look at what I've done yesterday, I don't remember how many letters this is. Is this Pogue? I can give you an update on the bug that I was stuck with yesterday uh, that did get resolved off stream. So this is my current workflow. I, I run Fortran, it creates this log, I copy and paste this log, I paste it into Scilab manually, and then I run that. So like it's really annoying to have to run a separate program. Uh, but yeah, uh, you can see that that bug from yesterday has been resolved. Uh, all of the splines are ending where they're supposed to end. <clears throat> I was doing more than just overshooting the endpoint. I was totally using the wrong control points for every single spline. Uh, so that's why it looked so bad yesterday. Uh, if I go to, where is the previous point? Yeah, so these places where I was calculating the implicit previous point from JP and the implicit next point from JN, uh, I was using like JN and JN minus one uh, that whole expression was off by one, so it should be jn and just j, the current point. Uh, if I look at if I look at that article that I was showing yesterday, I I hope I have a link to it. No, I didn't put a link in yet. So, and now I have it in my uncommitted readme. That's this article. So let's say that point uh, no, not point 0.5. Point 0.5 is a bad example because the adjacent points 4 and 6 are explicitly defined. Point 0.7 is a better example uh, because 6 is explicitly defined, but the next on-curve point is not explicitly defined. Uh, so the next control point after 7 should be the midpoint between 7 and 8, right? It's between the current point and the next point. What I was doing was looking at the midpoint between 8 and 9, but that's the wrong control point. It's off by 1. So that was the bug yesterday. Uh, it turned out to be pretty simple to resolve. <clears throat> uh, and then we can typeset things like the entire alphabet. I'll just uncomment these out. Uh, first of all, I'm working with glyph indices. Uh, one of the things on my roadmap is to uh, put in a string to be typeset, and then decode those Unicode code points and parse the CMAT data from the font header to uh, translate those Unicode code points into glyph indices. But for now, I have to work with glyph indices. So that's the way that this works. But then we can do the entire alphabet. <coughs> You can see it getting drawn in, well, I don't want to say real time, but in however long Scilab takes to draw this. 
The interesting thing is that Scilab resizes its canvas. So as like the letter Z pushes out, pushes out the right bound of this, uh, uh, this plot area, Scilab automatically resizes everything without redrawing everything as slow as it has done so far. So <clears throat> if I play that again, uh, it's gonna pop up on the other monitor, so I have to drag it over. So you can see each letter pushes over the right bound, but the <clears throat> the existing letters on the left, uh, they're, they're correctly squished as other things are added to the right. Uh, so one of the things I have to be careful with when doing my graphics in Fortran is that I need this idea of a canvas or a plot area. Uh, I, you don't really have to worry about that in Scilab. Because in Scilab, I can just say plot a line around like an x coordinate of 36,000. Uh, I know this is, that's behind my camera actually. Yes, so I can say plot a, a line with an x coordinate around 36,000, and then it just puts something there. Even if it's off the canvas, it will resize the canvas so that that point is now within the canvas. Uh, the way that I want this to work in Fortran is I want to set the size of my canvas totally ahead of time. So let me get this window there. All right. So in Fortran, I want to pre-allocate a canvas. Maybe not this big, maybe not 40,000 pixels, uh, but I might downscale this by like a factor of 10 or something and have 4,000 pixels across and say that like all of my pixels, they're going to have to be within this range. And if I try to draw something outside of that range, uh, either just skip it or write a warning or an error to my log file. Uh, so that's the English alphabet and the idea of canvases, then even though I'm working in a programming language, Fortran, that doesn't support Unicode, I can do the Greek alphabet because the Greek alphabet is in this font and all I need to do is know the indices and then if I have those indices, then I can draw those glyphs. <clears throat> And now we see the Greek alphabet instead of the Latin alphabet. So that's pretty cool. Fortran doesn't support Unicode, but I can draw glyphs from the Unicode character set as long as I know their indices in the font file that I'm parsing. That's the cool thing about pro uh, programming. Even if your language doesn't support a certain feature, you can sort of add support for that feature yourself. You can, you can bootstrap more powerful languages on top of lower level languages. Uh, and then also we can do different fonts. So just looking at the Cooper Black font. And then when I run that, I have to give it the name of the font file. I think it's like all uppercase. What was the name of that font file? I think I have it right here. Yeah, it's Coop BL. Uh, so I give it the name of the font file and redirect to a log. That didn't work. I have to rebuild that uh, because I was trying to do the Greek letters, but Greek letters probably don't exist in Cooper Black, or at least not at those indices. That worked. So here's a different font from the standard computer modern font from LaTeX that I've been using for most of my testing. Uh, obviously the kerning is all fucked up, but if you've ever been in the grocery store Wise, uh, they use this Cooper Black logo. It's, it's, it's a, a Cooper Black font for their logo. It's a pretty common font. Uh, you can find it like on the Beach Boys Pet Sounds album cover. <clears throat> uh, let's get the 
it's full screen. Is it bigger here? Yeah. So this is that same Cooper Black font from the Wise logo. Uh, so that's an interesting font. Uh, by the way, uh, Vox on their YouTube channel, they have an entire video. It's, it's like 10 minutes long or something just about this font. Uh, so if you're interested in fonts and think that that sounds like a fun thing to watch, uh, I guess I'll put a link to in, in the description. Yeah, so that's it. We can work with different fonts. We can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, but now I want to get start to get this translated from Scilab in Fortran so that I don't have to switch windows and like copy and paste from one file to a Scilab file and then run that manually. Uh, that whole process is really tedious. And then once we get this into Fortran, uh, I can start to have testing. So I can create an image file from Fortran and I can compare that to some expected output and then make automated integration tests or, or unit tests. I, I think it's more of an integration test. But then we can have that type of testing run automatically on the GitHub Actions workflow every time I make a commit and push. So uh, I made some more notes to myself about things that I want to change. Like instead of using this bitwise and operation, uh, I want to make this a function that just tells me whether a flag is flagged for on curve or not, because this is really not readable. Like I and on curve not equal zero. Does that mean it's on curve or does that mean it's off curve? It, it, it's really not clear from looking at the code, uh, but if I make this into a function with a proper name, like is on curve, then that should be more obvious. Uh, but like, I don't entirely feel safe doing those types of refactorings because I don't have testing yet. So I think I want to go ahead and do the image export first and then get some sort of testing suite. And then I can feel safer about refactoring things uh, and verifying that my refactor hasn't changed any behavior at all. Uh, but I do want to have a draw line function because right now we're drawing lines using Scilab, but then I want to have a draw line function that can agnostically do Scilab at first and then native Fortran eventually. Draw a line. Uh, we're going to have the points to draw. Actually, it's, there's no point copying and pasting because the syntax is going to be so much more compact. It's x, the x and y coordinates, so I use a colon there, uh, at j, and then x at j next from the next point. Uh, and I think that's, I'm going to need to pass some type of pixel array or canvas I could probably just have an array and pass that around, but I don't know if I want to add more data to the structure eventually. Uh, I'm just going to call it a canvas for now. Yeah, let's, let's do CV for canvas. I like short names. Uh, should that be the first argument? I feel like CV should be the first argument because all of my drawing functions are going to take the pixels. So they're always going to have that as an argument and I think I want it first. So we have the current point J, the next point JN, the pixels to draw it onto. Uh, maybe we'll pass a color. Like if you want to draw a black line versus a blue line or, or whatever. Not sure if I'll add that yet. Because I don't know what type I want my color to be. So I, th I think I'll leave that out for now. Uh, and I'll just make my function like this. <clears throat> uh... And 
I guess this will be a subroutine because it's not going to return anything. Maybe if you try to draw a pixel that's out of bounds of the canvas, that might be some type of error or warning. I, I probably don't want it to be a fatal error. Why did it just indent like that? What are you doing, Neovim? I have this problem where when I try to jump up 10 lines, that would be 10k, I believe. Uh, but k is just next to u in the Dvorak keyboard layout. So sometimes I accidentally do 10u instead of 10k, and that undoes 10 steps, which is kind of bad. Kelly. Hey, Kelly, come on. It's okay, Kelly. The namesake of the project has entered the room. Wanna say hi to Twitch? I gave you breakfast. What do you mean? Kelly. There she is. So I want to get my arguments in here. So canvas, and then what do I want to name these? P A and P B or P naught and P one. Let's say P one and P two. Fortran in indexes things from one, so let's do that for our variable names too. And then the types. Uh, I think for now C V is just going to be an array of pixels. Maybe I'll extend it in the future into a user defines type, like a C struct with more metadata about the pixel canvas. Uh, but yeah, uh, when you pass arrays around in Fortran, the size automatically gets passed along with them as long as you're using module functions and allocatable arrays. So yeah, you, I don't need to pass the size separately or like as part of a user defined struct. Like that's already automatic with Fortran. Uh, and the type, I'm, I'm, it's going to be an integer array for pixels. And I want to try to save memory. So if we have RGB and alpha, that would be four channels of one byte each, so four bytes. Uh, I want to try to do this as a four byte integer without having to make it twice as big as it needs to be. Hey, Kelly. What's up? She's trying to type something. And this is an allocatable array. And it's ranked 2, because there's going to be an X size of the image and a Y size, or like a width and a height. Kelly, I can't really use my mouse if you sit there. But I'm not going to move you just right now. Okay, so that's the canvas. Then what type is X? I think X is integer 8. Yeah, X is integer 8. And these are n-dimensional, using our nd parameter that we defined in the stream yesterday. This is 
in out because we're changing the canvas, but then these guys are intent in. You don't have to declare intents in Fortran, whether it's in or out or in out, uh, but it, it is safer if you do that. It stops you from accidentally changing something that you didn't plan on changing. So I, th I think it's a good practice to declare those things. Uh, now instead of X here, uh, first of all, we're, we're not going to do like the, the Fortran export just yet. Uh, we're we're going to keep it as the Scilab exporter. Uh, but for now, I want to refactor it and make sure that at least that still works. So with Scilab, we have to we have to change the ordering of these arguments. We have to pass all of the x coordinates first, and then all of the y coordinates. So p11 and p21. And then the second component of both of those. Do I have all of my commas and quotes correct? I think that that is still correct. So let's let's see. CV. And this will have to be passed in from the caller of Droglyph. Uh, but I'm not going to do that just yet. Uh, yeah, this is also going to be intent in L. I, I guess I should pass it in right now. So wherever I have draw glyph, and that's only called from main, that will have to pass in the canvas. And in main, it's not intent in out, because main owns this thing. Uh, if you're familiar with Rust and ownership, uh, my main program, is the thing that owns CV, and then that will pass it around to let all of my other things borrow it, all of my other subroutines borrow it. Uh, but Fortran doesn't really have a borrow checker, so uh, I, I'm totally free to shoot myself in the foot if I want to. Now all of the draw glyphs, uh, I think I can delete these, which just draw one letter. And I'm going to want to refactor this out of main eventually. So that instead of like calling draw glyph in a loop, I just have some other function called draw glyphs, which draws an entire string of glyphs. But for now, this is the way that it is. So this needs to pass the canvas. And it should allocate it here. Height, height, width. Did I spell height? Is it just height, not height? I, I'm sorry, I don't speak English. That's backwards, actually. 1920 by 1080. Uh, this is all totally arbitrary. Uh, eventually I might want a constructor which takes like the width and height and allocates the array for you, but for now canvas is just one array. There's not any more structure to it. Uh, it's going to be width first and then height. Kelly! I think my cat just wants attention.
So will this compile now? Okay, we just have an unused argument. It looks kind of looks like it still worked. That's pretty pogue. Eventually, we'll want to add an argument for the color. Uh, but for now, uh, well, for now it's Scilab, and there is no control. You can do colors in Scilab. Like... Actually, this might be interesting, so that we can see straight lines versus splines. Uh, you just put a string at the end of the plot argument. Uh, so like R is red, B is blue, uh, K is black. Let me use a double quote string because I'm already inside a stick single quote string in Fortran. Let's do R. Let's see what that looks like. There we go. Now all of my straight lines should be red, but all of my splines will still be blue because I haven't controlled that yet. There it is. Uh, you can see there aren't very many straight lines. There are just a few in the P mostly along this main column of the P and also inside the serifs of the P. And then like everything else is blue. All the curved stuff is blue. Uh, another thing that I didn't show yesterday was the way that the spline decomposition works. Uh, so Scilab only draws straight lines. So the way that I'm drawing splines is breaking down splines into a large number of straight lines. And I just hard coded that as like 10. Uh, I can show you what happens if I change that. So if I go to like a really low number, two, these letters will start to look more polygonal. So those are, those are kind of polygonal. It, it actually doesn't even look that bad. It, it looks better than what I was doing like two days ago with straight lines everywhere for just like one line segment per spline. Uh, but then I, I can refine that and use a larger number of lines. Uh, so let's do like 100. This will be crazy. You probably won't even be able to see the difference between 10 and 100. You can tell my Scilab script got longer. Now we have like 9,600 lines of Scilab. And this is going to take longer to, no, it's still plotted pretty fast. Yeah, so I don't think I can even see the difference between 10 and 100. Uh, let's get just the G. Actually, let's zoom in on the G first. Aspect ratio looks terrible. I don't know what the aspect ratio is supposed to be, but probably something about like that. So let's take a screenshot of that and then compare it to uh, 10. So this will do 10 line segments per Bezier curve now. I, I think I might be misusing the term spline. I think a lot of the time when I say spline, I mean one Bezier curve. But really what a spline is, is a series of Bezier curves. So I think I've been misusing that. Okay, here's 10 line segments per Bezier curve. Zoom in on the G again. Fix the aspect ratio and then compare to 100. 
Yeah, like at, at this scale, I, I don't think I can see a difference. Oh, we do have a straight line in the G. There's this red segment right there. And then everything else is a curve. And, okay, so I can see like a difference of about one pixel. Right here, there's one pixel that shoots off to the left a little bit. Right here, there isn't. But like it's almost imperceptible. Like here's here's that one pixel. Maybe it's two pixels. And then we don't have that in this version, at least not at this scale. If you zoomed in really far, or if you had something that was extremely curvy, uh, you might be able to tell the difference between 10 line segments per curve and 100. But for the most part, except for that one pixel, they look indistinguishable. Yeah, so that's what that parameter does. All right, now we have a draw line function. Let's make a draw Bezier function to draw a Bezier curve. Now, instead of taking two points like we do for a line, this function is going to take three. Draw Bezier 2 because it's a quadratic Bezier curve. Uh, you, you could have cubic Bezier curves, but not in TTF font files. TTF font files are only straight lines and quadratic Beziers. There's no cubic or higher, or higher order curves. Uh, and then this function is just going to be this thing. P1, P2, and P3. And then we'll have to update the body of this function a little bit. Jumped all over the place there trying to be fancy and like jump around in Vim using various shortcuts, but it, it always, it, it doesn't always do what I expect it to do. Uh, so I, I have a little bit to learn. I always try to learn new things with Vim. I don't want to stagnate and uh, keep, keep doing, keep working the exact same way with Vim. I like to learn new things. Uh, this is going to have similar arguments as draw line. Uh, and similar comments too. So I'm just going to copy that whole comment. But now instead of a line segment, it's a quadratic Bezier spline well, curve, I think. It's the difference between a Bezier spline and a curve. Okay, yeah, so it's pretty much what I said, and I was definitely misusing this term yesterday. So a spline is a series of Bezier curves, and a Bezier curve is just one of them. So that's why I named this draw Bezier, not draw spline, because it's not a spline, this just draws one curve. Start point P1 to end point P3 with middle off curve control point P2. So P1 is at the start, P3 is at the end, and P2 is in the middle. Uh, so I think it makes sense to have them in this order. You could do this differently. Instead of passing three different arguments for each points, you could just do one, which is like three, or nd by three. That would probably be the efficient way to do it uh, if you wanted all in one argument. But I, I think for th two or three points, I think it's fine to have three separate arguments. So I'll leave it like that. 
Uh, and then we have some local variables here. So this function is a little bit more complicated than drawing a line. Uh, we actually don't use n spline anywhere outside of this function, so we can just move that. And spline, and then there's it and t. It is the integer. T is a double. Okay, so it is integer eight. I have to remember that. I think that might be it. Am I calling this correctly? I think, I think not. No, I'm calling it with two points. So I need A, B, and C. A, B, C, oh, and then I, I need to update the body of that function. Yeah, so B is defined there. Don't even really need a temporary variable for B. I could just pass X, J directly there. But then C is defined and a, yeah, A is defined. So A and C need to be variables because they could be one of these explicitly defined points or they could be one of these implicit points which is halfway between the current point and the next point. Uh, so we need variables for A and C, B not so much. And then I need to update the body of this function. This is now One, P2, P3. I think that's it. Let's see if that compiles. That compiled. Oh, notice I also fixed all of my compiler warnings since yesterday, and then today I'm, I'm adding new ones. So I have these unused arguments that I'm not doing anything with the canvas yet. Uh, that's okay, we'll, we'll get to the canvas once we migrate away from Scilab. That still looks pretty pogue. Okay, what next? So yeah, yeah, I think we can start migrating to Fortran. Uh, so instead of exporting the Scilab source code, what I want to do is set pixels in the canvas CV. But then I need to export that canvas to a PPM file. Uh, I need to refresh myself on the PPM format because there are like six variations of them. There's like black and white, grayscale, and color. So that's three. And then you also have ASCII and binary versions of each of those. So multiply by three by two. Those are six different variations of the PPM format. Okay, it's net PBM. Yeah, so there's a uh, pix map, gray map, and bitmap. Uh, I forget which one is black and white and which one is color, but PGM is obviously grayscale. Okay, so PixMap is the color one. So it starts off with a magic number to identify the format. Which one is it? Yeah, it's PPM. PPM is the one that I want. So we have the magic number, and we have the width and height. Uh, I don't remember if this is in the binary version. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to go straight to at, straight to binary, but if I have trouble with a binary implementation, I, I might do this ASCII format to start. Uh, but, but if I can do binary, that's better because it's going to be a smaller file size and faster, faster writes and faster reads if I have a reader too. Uh, for now, to start, I'll just have a writer, not a reader. about the binary version. Yeah, 
Is there an alpha channel? Maybe there's no alpha. Okay, 24 bits per pixel. That's interesting. So I guess there's no alpha. Okay, so the reason that I'm looking at this so carefully is that these values are from 0 to 255. Uh, so that's like an unsigned one byte integer, right? 0 is the minimum, and 255 is the maximum one byte unsigned integer. Uh, but Fortran, as I've mentioned repeatedly in like every one of my last few videos, does not have unsigned integers, it only has signed integers. So if I store this data as one byte per channel, I need to be careful that I can write 255 and not like negative uh, one instead of 255. So I think before I write a whole PPM file, I just want to test if I can write one byte correctly. So we have a canvas, uh, probably want to initialize it to zero. I don't know. Yeah, like I might change the type of this canvas instead of width by height, I might have it like three or four by width by height so that I have like a, the, uh, the red, green, and blue channels as a separate index of the array. I, I, I don't know. So for, for now, I guess I'll try it with integer four. And then like I might make it integer, integer one, but like increase the rank of the array to account for that. Just not sure how useful it would be to like address each channel individually once you set a color. Uh, I, th I think this draw glyph function will also need a color argument. So we're going to draw all the glyphs and then we're going to export the canvas as PPM. Uh, what do I want to name that function? Probably just write PPM or maybe write IMG.
It might be a mistake for me to uh, tie the names of my structures to the specific format. Uh, so like, I'm using TTF to represent the font. Like maybe I should just call this font or typeface or something more generic so that I'm not tied to the format of the font file in the names of my variables and structures. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty far along with TTF, so I think I'll leave that. But then for my image exporter, I might call it write IMG instead of write PPM. Going to take the canvas and the file name. And I think that's it. Uh, what else is in this format? We have headers, magic numbers, dimensions, the max, uh, yeah, I want to just call this IMG, not PPM. That's the whole point. Uh, where do I want to put this? The problem with not making an easier defined type for my canvas already is that I have integer 4 in about 3 or 4 different places. So if I change the type of this, I'm going to have to change it in a bunch of places. Uh, so maybe this is a mistake and I should do a struct instead of a raw built-in array. Uh, but let's, let's see how this turns out. So first I, I just want to write one byte and see if I can do those as the expected values in a binary file. Where do I open things? Here's the opener for the reader, and then for the writer. It's going to be similar, but instead of read, it's going to be write. Uh, file name. Declare that in this function. Let's get these declared in order. Uh, this is no longer in out, this is just in. File name is in. You have the unit of the file. Input output status. And I think that's it. Open it and then close it at the end. Let's see if this compiles. And there we have an empty file. Empty. Zero bytes. So that's good so far. And I just want to write one byte. one byte or four bytes. So the canvas is four bytes, uh, but I'm going to sort of decompose that. I'm not sure about my endianness. I might change this to little endian. I don't know which one is right yet. Uh, yeah, but we're going to have to decompose 
this thing into individual bytes because we have to skip the alpha channel. Uh, but before before writing three bytes for R, G, and B, I just want to see if I can write one byte. So, one byte integer. Let's call it dummy. First thing is zero. Can I write a zero? This should have a zero. Uh, it's binary, so I need to hex edit this. Percent bang xxd, and okay, it's a zero, and then there's a new line. Um, might be okay. See what happens if I write two zeros. We should have two bytes of zeros and then I guess a new line for whatever reason. I don't know why a new line is getting added to the end of my binary file. Okay, now we have two bytes of zeros and a new line inexplicably. It should be okay if there's like one byte of junk at the end of the file. Uh, everything should just ignore that. Oh, sorry, I've been missing the chat. Uh, like, where is my where is my chat doc? Sorry, Connie, I've been missing your chat. Uh, the G has some red. What about PBM? It's just zero one for black and white. Do I need grayscale? Uh, no, I don't really need it. Uh, I, I could just do black and white, but I, I would kind of like to support colors. Uh, so if we look at the Wikipedia page for Computer Modern, there's this cool demonstration image of the font itself on the Wikipedia page. Uh, so, so I'd like to be able to make something like this. Like they have, uh, they have this, I don't know what to call it, off-white background and the blue background, and then white text, black text, and blue text. So I'd, I'd like to be able to do something like this. Uh, maybe not with all this typesetting with uh, italics and non-italic and stuff all over the place in the image. Uh, but if I can support color, I'd like to. Beige. Yeah, I think beige is better. So can I write one byte? Uh, zero. Now 255 is going to be interesting because that might overflow. What happens if I try to write 255? This might be a compiler warning or error right here because this is bigger than a one byte signed integer. That only goes up to like 128 or 127. Yeah, so that's actually a compile time error. Do I want to add F no range check? I feel like that could be dangerous. Negative one should be the same thing. So negative one as a signed integer should be the same as a 255 as an unsigned integer, I think. So this, this should be like FF. Uh, I, I think I'll have, yeah, I should have FF and then an other FF. So there it is. Let's see if I can write zero and then FF. There it is, zero and then FF. Uh, but 
in the general case, I'm not going to be writing one byte. I'm going to write a four byte integer and I want to extract just the R, G, and B channels because PBM does not have alpha. It's only red, green, and blue. Uh, does this say anything about alpha? Oh, 2000 PAM format was added to support alpha. Don't know how widely supported that is. So I think I'll keep it with PPM instead of PAM because I, I don't really need alpha, especially in the final image. I might have an intermediate support for alpha where you can like overlay things on top of each other and blend them together. But then when the final image is exported as one layer, we don't really need alpha in there. So let's make a four byte integer and try testing that. It's called dummy four. This should be some type of warning or error. Dr. Fortran, by the way, is a Fortran expert. Uh, if you've never read one of his articles and you're interested in Fortran, check him out. I don't know. Unsigned integers are best to be avoided in C++? Why? Huh. I guess Bjorn Struestrup himself says that, so... You gotta trust the inventor of the language. Un 
unless you're dealing with raw memory contents or performing bit manipulations like shifting or masking, and that's what I'm doing. I might want a helper function where I can give it RGB alpha in a format like this, and then it creates a four byte integer for me. But like I, I need a temporary eight byte integer to avoid overflow. So let's call it new color. It's going to take an integer eight. And then if it overflows, it's going to subtract so that it doesn't overflow. Sorry, I'm, I'm missing the chats again. Uh, I was about to say I use you in literally almost every time. Yeah, in C++, yeah. Well, well Bjorn says don't do it, and Bjor, Bjorn Strustrap invented C++. thing. What am I doing? Okay. Uh, might have to manually typecast that. Use integer 16 as the default. Can I do that? I think this, this isn't going to be portable because I don't think Intel Fortran has integer 16. At least I don't think every compiler has it. Uh, it's, it's not i16, it's i128. Lots of unused arguments now. Uh, now, so if it doesn't overflow, we just copy it. If it does overflow, we'll have to subtract something. This might be off by one, but this is the basic idea. I have no idea what that does. Let's write this to a file. It 
should be all Fs, and then the inexplicable new line. Nope, that's not even close. Is this the right way to wrap it around? Oh, I think I have it backwards. FFFF. I think both of those are wrong. I want huge I eight. Plus one. <sighs> Just let me do it, man. <laughs> Hey, that's what I wanted. Uh, is there a simpler way to do this? And can I do it without using int 16? So this seems to work. Right, because I have all Fs. One, two, three, four bytes of Fs. Every, every pair of characters is one byte. That's how hexadecimal works. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
two, three, four bytes of Fs getting written to the file, and then an inexplicable new line at the end, which I think shouldn't be a problem. Uh, and it compiles with a bunch of warnings about uh, unused arguments. Uh, and yeah, there's this warning about possible overflow. Would like to be able to suppress this somehow. So this works, but can I do it without casting up to int 16? Because I think not every compiler has 16 byte integers. I think I can just like take the plus one out of parentheses and then it becomes minus one because we have to distribute this minus sign. That's the same thing, that's good. And then can I do it without int 16? something that I didn't want to type. Yeah, it seems to be working. Uh, what kind of warnings am I getting? Possible change in value and another possible change in value. So I think if I explicitly cast those it should stop complaining. But will it still write the correct thing? Looks correct. Yeah. I think that works. Uh, let me try some other things. All F's is white, I believe. All zeros would be black. So, so the reason I wanted to make this helper function is that it automatically does the type conversion for me and prevents overflow or underflow or whatever that is. Uh, so now I can make various colors. Uh, Yeah, do I want to? I, I think I have to cast it here. Otherwise, it's a compiler warning. And I want to try to keep the warnings minimal so that I can see things when I compile without scrolling all the way up past the warnings to get to the error when I have an error. So uh, I think I don't even need this temporary dummy thing. I can just write a new color directly. So let's try, let's try all zeros first of all. One more. So let's see if this gets written correctly. And we'll also see if the endianness is what we expect, because I think the endianness matters in PPM files. Okay, so we have zeros, then we have alpha, uh, G, B, and R. So I think that's correct. Uh, those right in the correct order. So first zeros, then f's at the end, f's one byte from the end, f's one byte from the beginning, and then f at the beginning. So I think that seems to work at least with those four basic colors. 
Uh, yeah, well, let me try like all Fs as well. Because like I, I think I already tested that, but I just want to be sure. So now we should get one more group of all Fs at the end here. Yeah, I, I think that seems to be working. Okay, so I know how to write colors and I, I know how to construct colors and write them into a binary file without corrupting like the endianness or the uh... actually we have one more problem I want to write one byte at a time so I think I can do this with bit shifting and some other bitwise operations so I, I need to write this without the alpha channel, uh, and unless I go to the PAM format. Like the PAM apparently supports alpha. I don't know how portable and how widely supported that is. It's from the year 2000. Depth and tuple. I don't know, it, it might be too complicated. <laughs> Do they have examples of this? I don't know. I, th I think the PPM example on Wikipedia is better. So I'm going to try to stick with that. So how can I write three bytes? I think I have to write it one byte at a time. And then skip the final byte. Skip the alpha byte. So let's try that. I guess I'll leave that stuff in there for now. But eventually I'll delete that after I get it committed. So the first byte is here. And how do I shift bytes in Fortran? There's like an I S H F T. It, it has some some kind of funny name. Got it right, I-S-H-F-T. Is there one that's circular? Yeah, there's one that's circular, and there's this one which is not circular. I, I don't really care whether it's circular or not because I, I just need to extract the bytes after I shift them. Extract one byte after I shift them. Less than zero is a right shift. 
make this not all Fs. That way I can see which color is which. Uh, let's, let's put them in a logical order. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, so the first one is going to be red. I S H F T. It's the thing to shift and then the amount to shift. Negative three bytes is three bytes to the right. And I'm going to want to, um, I don't know, do I need to do anything? Will this even compile or will it warn me about overflow? That's a possible change in value. Maybe I can just cast. So let's do that and then let's write it. So what should it be? It should be A, B. What the hell am I writing there? Where is all this data coming from? The file should not be that long. Oh, I remember. So zero. I think we did write, but we got the wrong stuff in there. So when you open a file like this, there, there can be junk at the end of the file from the previous version of that file. Open mode. I know we're doing the right action. Action is right. Status. I think I might want status new. This might fail if it already exists. Yeah, existence is an error. So I don't really want that. I want to remove the file before I start. I don't think there's really a good way to do that either. Status, wait, status equals delete? I don't think that's portable. Does this work? Oh, close. I don't know why Oracle has so much Fortran documentation. Okay. So this is kind of cumbersome. Uh, I probably want a function to do this. First of all, 
default one, two, three, four is terrible. Uh, to space out my equal signs. I don't know why people write like this. So apparently that should delete the file. Uh, I don't have stat, I'm gonna call it IO. Should delete the file. There we go. Okay, so still I have the wrong bytes. I have E0. How am I ending up with E0? No, seriously, how am I ending up with E0? <laughs> or an error. Same thing. So I think I need to and this with Fs. direction. Okay, so alpha I should shift zero. B I should shift once, twice, three bytes. Should be a three byte shift. Maybe it's positive three instead of negative three. Well, that's even worse. Okay, what if I forget this and just write dummy four? Because am I am I converting this to a color correctly? A B C D E F zero zero. Yeah, that's the color that I expect. shift at all, it should be zeros. That's zeros. If I shift by one, it should be EF. But it's not, it's eight zero. Is 
that I think this is overflowing. Eight zero. Because what if I make it to two bytes? No, if I make it four bytes. What the hell? If I do the and and then shift it. Hey, welcome back, Connie. Uh, sorry if I missed your chat earlier. I, I think maybe I, I read your chats when you were you taking a break. Okay, so this does not seem to be working if I shift the bits and then and. I think I might try doing this in the other order by ending it and then shifting the bits. So what does this do? all zeros. If I shift positive three. Oh, hold on. I'm gonna comment that out. Still all zeros. What if I shift by positive three? Is this all zeros? Oh. So that one kind of makes sense. But if I if I do the shifting and the ending in the opposite order, I have to change the mask. Oh, come on, man. <laughs>
Well, this overflows, but can I do, can I get the first byte? I think it should be a negative one shift. No, that's not right. It should be EF. Positive one. No, that's not right either. All the bits. Oh my god. I've been shifting bits instead of bytes. So I have to multiply by eight. Duh. <laughs> Why would there be a byte shift operation? Uh, so that should be eight times one. Oh my god, was that it the whole time? And that is EF. I think that's what I expected. All right. That's kind of working. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to do the shift and then the and. So let's try to get that working. Wait, was it? It's positive. Hmm. Actually, I want byte to actually be a byte. So let me go back and make this one byte. A, B, A, B. And we don't even need to AND because it's one byte. So we should have A, B, then C, D, then E, F. When we shift by three bytes, then two bytes, then one byte. And then we're not doing the alpha, so there's no zero, zero. We get A, B, C, D, E, F. A, B, C, D, E, F. That's it. That was so simple. I just had to read the fucking manual and shift by bits, not bytes. So I had to multiply by eight. All right. So that's how we write one byte at a time from a four byte integer. I think we don't even need this temporary byte variable. Uh, yeah, so let's test that without the temporary variable. So that should be the same thing. A, B, C, D, E, F, looks good. What if I reverse the bytes? F, E, D, C, B, A. F E D C B A looks good. Okay, so now that I can write one color, now we have to write a whole PPM file. Right, that was so difficult. Uh, I think I might actually want to commit 
right now, even though I don't I don't have like a working PPM export at all. But I'm gonna commit this because I know that this works to write three bytes. Uh, and then I can like clean up some of this junk that's commented out. Now I can delete a bunch of stuff without worrying that I'm going to lose something from not having version control. And then we can write a whole PPM file. Initialize my color as I initialize it as zero, so that should be black. I'll leave that as is for now, and then I'll try testing the canvas with like different colors. Uh, but the first thing I'll just try black. So, what is in a PPM file? this and then a new line. Right, they say the last header line must be 2555 and then a new line and then with data immediately following it. There's a new line character at the end of each line. These have to be like 80 characters wide or something? No, I don't think so. So we don't actually want to write that because that's just a test. Uh, but it's not three, two. It's the dimensions. Is it height width or width height? The width and then the height. Those have to be formatted in ASCII, so we're not writing like binary integers. Uh, I think I might finally need a helper function for that. Also, we need new lines. So new line is character 10. 
I need to refer to an ASCII table. New line, line feed. Line feed is 10. And then instead of these hard-coded dimensions, we want to have a string conversion helper. Size canvas one, which is the width. And then a space. And then size canvas two. And then a line feed. I think that's it. I just need to define this string function. So the way that you convert an integer to a string in Fortran is kind of weird. You use the right statement, but it's a statement, so then that like prevents you from using it in places where you would want to use a function. Uh, so you have to write your own wrapper function like this. So you have to write to a buffer, which is a fixed size. It can't be like dynamically sized. Uh, so you have to write your integer to the buffer, and then you can trim the buffer to have like a truly trimmed string without any extra white space or padding around it. So I think that should work. Let's see if that compiles. Let's see if those dimensions are formatted correctly. So 1920 by 1080, and then we have new lines at the end of each line, and then we can dump the binary data. Uh, is that right? No, PPM, and that should be, okay, they're RGB triplets. So red, then green, then blue. Uh, and it's it's across the rows first, which is good because that's the way that my data is oriented in Fortran. So we're going to loop through through y first. And then within that we're going to loop through x. So y goes through the height and then x is going to go through the width.
And then within that, we're going to break down the bytes into R, G, and B. Uh, but now instead of dummy, we're going to put in our actual canvas data. So it's going to be CV for the canvas, and we need to index the current x and y positions, i, x, i, y, and then negative 3 times 8 for the red channel. Cast that to an integer 1, and 2 for blue, 1 for green. And that should be it. Uh, there might be a more efficient way to write this without explicit loops. Uh, but th this should be good enough. This file should be big now. Yep, there's a bunch of stuff in here. If we hex edit that, it's all zeros. Uh, if I resize that, yeah, you can see it's all zeros. Uh, and then hopefully the size is right. And then there's this junk new line at the end, but I think that should be okay. Uh, let's see if I can open that file, yeah, and it should just be a black rectangle. Uh, what can I open this with? I, I think I can open it with GIMP. Does like does Windows natively support this? Can I do like paint? Photos. Paint should be okay, right? Paint cannot read this file. Uh, well, it's associated with LibreOffice for some reason, so let's see if that works. thinking? What is this doing? Um, what about GIMP? Can GIMP handle this? GIMP can't even browse through my file directories. <laughs> oh, I go up a folder. Okay, what if I drag and drop into GIMP? Should be a black rectangle. Hey! There we go, GIMP can handle it. Uh, let's try another color. Let's try like red or green or blue. Get this window sized. So LibreOffice is not cooperating. I don't know why Microsoft Paint can't open this file. Uh, that's kind of annoying. So I'm, I'm going to have to figure out a better way to preview these files without so many clicks because this is just as bad as visualizing things in Scilab if I have to like drag and drop a file into GIMP every time I want to see it. But let's try a red rectangle. How did I call this thing? Let's do blue. Let's do a blue rectangle. 
Uh, and the cool thing about Fortran, so new color returns a scalar. I can just initialize the whole array to a scalar like this. I don't need to loop through everything. Uh, it's just all automatic. Okay, apparently the file is locked. Don't know if that's because of LibreOffice. <laughs> what a piece of shit. Or maybe it's because of GIMP. Let's just try discarding GIMP. Kill LibreOffice from Task Manager. Okay, that fixed the file lock. And then if I look at this now, it should be blue. It's not blue. Did I... It's definitely not... It shouldn't be black. Is it black? No, I don't want to hit that, that's going to mess up my terminal. So it's from right now. I swear it's just not like reloading the file. Make it white. That should be all Fs. I look at it in the hex editor. I'm gonna take a second to load because this is a fairly large file now. And it's all Fs. We have the magic number. Wait, oh my god, I have the magic number wrong. It's P6. For binary, not P3. Yeah, P6 should be the binary one. So maybe maybe that was why Paint wouldn't open it and <laughs> LibreOffice just hung forever. Uh, so P3 is P6. Let's rerun that. Drag that into GIMP. This should be white now. Yeah. Okay, let's try blue. Okay. I don't really need this hex edited. Let's try blue. There we go, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, now, because Fortran is so good with arrays, we can fill rectangles without even making a function for rectangle filling. So, let's do a black background by initializing everything with zeros. And then let's fill a rectangle from like the top three quarters, the top left three quarters of the image, uh, plus, plus a little bit of a margin. Uh, you know what, let's just not even do math. Let's just do like 100 through 1600, and then 100 through 700. So we can just fill a rectangle like this with built-in array expressions in Fortran. Uh, so we have a black background. Let's not even make it black. Let's make it a little bit gray. Uh, 
RGB. Let's make it not fully saturated blue. Let's check that out in GIMP. I wonder if there's a way to like reload a file without just discarding and re-importing. Uh, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to figure out how to preview these images more efficiently off stream, but for now, I'll just keep doing the drag and drop thing. So there we go. We have kind of a grayish background with a blue rectangle, and then we can do multiple rectangles. Uh, we can do another one that overlaps with this. Uh, so let's do... Six hundred through eighteen hundred. Let's put G there, and then let's do a third rectangle. Let's do like a small rectangle in the middle. So, uh Maybe 800 or maybe 900 to uh, 1200. And what do I want these bounds to be? Uh, I don't know, 400 to 800, and then this one's going to be red-ish. So we should have three different rectangles that are three different colors, all on top of a gray background. That's it. So that's pretty cool. Uh, if you've seen Soding's graphics library video, uh, he, he made a graphics library in pure C. Uh, and he needed a function to fill a rectangle. But the cool thing about Fortran is we don't, we don't even need to make a function to fill rectangles. We can just do this with built-in array operations by setting slices of the array with like the X range of subscripts and the Y range of subscripts. Uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to have enough time to truly start drawing things in like uh, the font outlines in here on today's stream but this is this is like a good start uh, right mouse right mouse open with gimp yeah uh, do i paint dot net uh, uh, sorry connie I've, I've been missing your chats all day i need to figure out how to get this docked back into a separate window yeah, I, I don't know, I'll, I'll have to figure that out, but paint.net. What is paint.net? Yeah, this, this might work. It's free. I'll have to try that out. Yeah, so th thanks for the tip, Connie. I think I can commit this, and then maybe I'll start on drawing lines. Uh, 
the problem is like the coordinates because now that I have a canvas, I have to make sure that I'm doing everything within that canvas. So I'll need to like scale my glyphs down because I don't want to necessarily like 2000 font units wide for one character. So that's something that I have to think about. So I, I need to be careful with units. I want to have a parameter like pixels per M because the font has M's or units per M. Yeah, the font has units per M, and then I want to define a certain re resolution in pixels per M, and then I can convert from font units to pixel units. So where do I want to put that? Like, it doesn't really belong in the TTF struct, but when I draw a glyph onto the canvas, it needs to know that scale. I might just kind of hard code things for now and get it cleaned up later. <clears throat> uh, but before I even do this in Fortran, I think I want to check my Y values. Because we have an X axis and a Y axis. So the x-axis is vertical, no, the x-axis is horizontal, and the y-axis is vertical. Uh, so x is fine, x is going from like 1,000 to 5,000. I might need to scale it down, but it's positive numbers, so that's okay. y-axis, uh, first of all, we have negative numbers and positive numbers, but the y-axis is going up. Like the more positive you get, the more it goes up. My image dimensions have Y going down because that's the way that uh, image pixels are indexed. Uh, when, when, I, when I write the image file, I write the first row first. So like Y of one is at the top of the image and Y of 1900 or, or 1080 or whatever my image height is, that's at the bottom of the image. So I'm going to need to invert the Y coordinates and I want to make them all positive too. Uh, and to do that, I need to add like the, uh, the, the M width. 
but not, not really in font units, but I want to do it in pixel units eventually. And then I need to invert that so that y is going positive down. So I think I want to do that in Scilab first before I export that into my Fortran canvas. And, and I want to have like an input argument for the Y translation so that we translate down by like one line for the first line of text. And then if we have a second line of text, we want that to be even further below the first line. I'm just going to be lazy for now and like hard code things. So I'm going to scale things down by 10. So we're just going to multiply by the scale there. Maybe I shouldn't call it scale because that's a keyword apparently. Uh, but let, let, let's just see if it works. Then I want to invert the y coordinates and I want to add some number to the y coordinates. see what happens if I do 100. Uh, so this should flip everything upside down in Scilab, but then when I export that in, in, in the, uh, the image coordinates with Y down from Fortran, eventually it should be okay. That's not good. CV glyph X not passing the canvas and then the glyph. What type is canvas? It's integer four allocatable. Uh, I probably want to set my alpha correctly, even though it's not really used. CV is integer four. What the hell is going on? This is, where is this happening? X is allocatable. This should automatically, I don't know, maybe this doesn't automatically allocate correctly. Uh, so let's do it without the scaling. Okay, the scaling was the problem. Uh, and I should be able to scale it in here. That seems to be okay. And then this should, it doesn't do anything. Oh. This 
should invert the image in Scilab. The kerning is messed up because of the scale that I've done, uh, but yeah, it's, it's inverted. That part looks okay. I just need to account for the scale here, so instead of 1400, I'm just going to do 140. That's a little bit more reasonably spaced. Uh, so X is still going from left to right, but now Y is inverted. Uh, I still have some negative numbers, so I think I want to translate a little bit more. So add like another 40, or might as well add another 100. Translate that by 200 in Y. We'll have to clean that up later, but for now I'll just hard code it. Y coordinates are positive, so I should be ready to start to write this onto the canvas. Uh, I don't know if I'll t have time to do splines, but I might be able to do lines. So we already have the canvas as an argument. And then I need to have an integer to loop through either the x-coordinate or the y-coordinate, uh, whether it's a vertical or horizontal line. I don't really care. Uh, so I'll have a trick for that. If we're going to loop with i. And we're going to need a real value, too. So if my line is vertical or horizontal, I want to loop through whichever dimension is the biggest. So I think I want to go from zero. I want to go from zero. I think I need like another another variable for n, the number of steps that I'm going to do. So n is going to be the max of the abs of p2 minus p1. So if it's vertical, this is going to be some positive number. If it's horizontal, it's still going to be a positive number because I'm taking the max of the x and y difference. Uh, this is an array. Uh, yeah, I think that needs to be max val. And then we're going to convert i to a float. So float is i divided by n, uh, but we have to multiply to cast it to a real. Uh, this, this is the same way that I did splines. Like I have an integer loop, and then I convert it to a real inside of there. Right, so we're going to loop, and then the pixel pixel index within the loop is going to be an integer 8. Which is going to be p and it's n-dimensional. Uh, and that's going to be like a lerp. So the lerp is going to be 
P1 plus uh, F times P2 minus P1. I might have to cast this. I think I'll have to cast this back to an integer. Uh, but then we're just going to set the pixel. So the canvas at this pixel location is going to be, let's set it to a foreground color uh, instead of gray for the foreground. Let's do uh, like a whitish color. And that might work. That might be it for drawing lines. Uh, splines is going to be another thing, but for now this should get like, uh, in Scilab, like I'm plotting the straight lines as red and the, cur the Bezier curves as blue. So this should take care of the straight lines in red. Hey, <laughs> I think, I think that's it. Uh, so imagine this upside down. You can see like the straight lines of the P. And then there's also one little straight line in the G as well. So those are the straight lines. I think we can do curved lines. It, it shouldn't be too hard, really. Uh, straight lines was not that difficult. So let's do the splines. But the hard part is N. So like how many pixels do I have to loop through? I think I'm just gonna like, it, really you would want the arc length of the spline, uh, but I don't really know how to calculate the arc length. So I think I'm just gonna do the length of the line segments between the control points uh, and then times some padding so that I'm not skipping pixels. Actually, I can, I can take out the Scilab now. So uh, it's going to be like the norm between all of the control points. Uh, will that compile? Just want to see if this compiles. three minus P two. And then times some buffer. Uh, I'm just going to multiply that by two. Probably going to draw more pixels than I need to. It's going to like draw the same pixel twice, but this is quick and easy. Uh, right, I deleted the norm somehow. something like this, but with a spline instead of a straight line. Uh, maybe
Maybe I should call it T instead of F. T is the spline parameter. So it makes sense to use that for a straight line too. should like refactor this and not do the color within the loop every time so that's not really optimal but I think that should draw splines now hopefully it's not too fucked up that did not work oh, I built it but I didn't run it this is the moment of truth fingers crossed that's pretty pogue. Isn't that pogue? I think that's pretty pogue. Uh, it, it really looks like shit. Like, uh, it, it needs anti-aliasing. But, uh, can I not scroll with more resolution? Where's the bottom of my window? Yep, so that's basically it. Uh, I think I'm going to commit this and then wrap up the stream for today. Uh, so, yeah, like it, it looks like shit. Uh, it needs anti aliasing. Uh, but th these are outlines. What I want to do eventually is fill in the outlines. So, there's no point for me anti aliasing the outlines. Uh, the, the real thing is going to be filling it in. So, I'm, I'm not going to bother with anti aliasing this temporary step. Uh, and, and I might not get around to anti-aliasing at all. So, yeah, this is pretty pogue. Uh, let's let's do some other text. Let's do the Wise logo in Cooper Black. I think I can delete this too. We're we're basically done with Scilab. Uh, I don't need I don't need the Scilab code anymore. So here in main. Do the Y's logo. Uh, I think I need bounds checking, so I, I don't know how much to translate this and how big my canvas has to be. Uh, so this might overflow and it might crash my program because right now I, I don't have any bounds checking. If P is outside of the canvas, uh, this could be a problem. Uh, so I'll, I'll need to check that. Don't really need to redirect because it doesn't really print Scilab code anymore. Yep. Uh, 686 686 Okay, I don't know what I ran We should have the Y's logo now Yeah, I was out for a jog yesterday and I jogged past my local Y's store I was looking at the font, I was like, isn't that Cooper Black? I went home and I googled Cooper Black again to like look at them side by side, and I was like looking really closely at the dot over the eye. Uh, because it's, it's an oval, but it's not a perfectly horizontal oval, it's a little bit tilted. So I looked at that and I was like, yeah, that's Cooper Black. So it's, it's the very common, very recognizable font. Uh, obviously the kerning is all fucked up, uh, that's going to be something that I fix at some other time. But I think I can commit this and then wrap up the stream for today.
How on time you've returned. Yeah, welcome back. You got back for the good part. So let's see if that runs on the cloud. There's a good chance I've written some code that's not portable, so this might not compile and it might not run. Oh yeah, the last few commits have not passed. Might not have time to deal with this now. Usually I work a bunch on stream and then like something breaks or there's a bug that I can't figure out. Oh, just, oh, well that's easy. Yeah, because the scratch directory doesn't exist. Uh, so I, I, do, I don't really want to clutter up my repo by having this untracked file. That's why I put it in the scratch directory. Uh, but that directory doesn't exist remotely, so I, I can't write it there. Seems like it compiled, it just didn't run. So I'll have no way of getting this file or checking it. Yeah, so it says, it says it wrote the file and then it finishes. So I have no way of viewing this file. Uh, there are ways that you can like upload artifacts from GitHub workflow builds, uh, but the better thing for me to do is uh, make an expected, expected output of the test image and store that in my repo, and then compare this to the expected output uh, so that I can have automated testing that checks if the files are the same. Uh, so that's, that's probably what I'll do next weekend, but for now, I'm gonna wrap up the stream. Uh, thanks again for joining, Connie, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'll catch you next time. Bye.